Uh, he's preached uh, about God's grace through, uh, through Western Europe, throughout the United States, Central America. Uh, he has a wonderful wife, Amanda. Between the, those two, the, they have three children, two, boy, uh, two uh, daughters, um, Presley and, and Audrey, and a new son, Emmett, of which we have been praying quite a bit about. Wesley has a true passion for uh, the Lord's church and for, for people. It's not something he just preaches about. It's something that he truly tries to, to live. And so we're excited about hearing what he has to uh, say to us this afternoon as he preaches to us the word of God. All natural, 100% salvation. Wesley. Richard mentioned I am a native of Tennessee, and my beloved volunteers are kicking off in roughly two minutes against Alabama. But luckily this year, the entire year, we played terrible in the first half, so he scheduled this perfectly. I can preach during the first half and then watch the comeback in the second half when our sessions today are over and, and finished with. We'll be praying for a miracle, I guess, as part of that. <laughs> You know, if something is said enough times, whether it's true or false, eventually people begin to believe it. If you think for a moment about politicians, this election, previous elections, you will notice a repeated phrase a certain politician will use to either try to get the audience to believe it about themselves or about the other person. They'll talk about maybe a particular problem they think the person they have has, and they'll use that phrase over and over and over again. Whether it's true, whether it's false, it doesn't matter. Their goal is simply to get a portion of the population to believe certain things about that particular person. They understand that when you look at any election, there's a certain percentage going to vote one way or the other, no matter what candidate's there or what happens. They're going for those undecided voters, and they want to make those undecided voters view the other person as unfavorable as, pop as possible. So they repeat a phrase, and repeat a phrase, and repeat a phrase, and eventually those phrases we have in our head, we, we might start associating with them with the other guy. And so then the other guy who might believe that phrase, and not just be a, a political twist, but the truth about that person's character or policy, and hopefully they believe that we'll let that influence us and vote the way they want us to. They understand the power of messaging. As you use the same words enough time, eventually people think it's true. PR firms are paid a lot of money to get messaging right. You know, somebody does something really bad. I'm, I'm a sports guy, so an, an athlete does something terrible. He immediately goes and talks to his publicist or his PR person, and they set up a, a scenario in which he's going to stand before an audience, and he's got a very well-written-out public statement he's going to make. And then when they ask him questions, it's refer back to the public statement because that PR team knows the wording of what he says is very important. So every time he speaks on a specific subject, he has the line he's going to go to each and every time because he knows, hopefully, some people will believe whatever spin he's putting on that particular situation. They understand that messaging matters. If you're a Cubs fan, uh, this is the year you have hope for maybe a World Series, but the Cubs for the longest time were marketed as the lovable losers. You had a team that lost every single year but yet had a full stadium at Wrigley. People would come and watch their games. They have WGN to, to broadcast, and they had great ratings because it was cool to like the Cubs. I mean, it's okay. They're the lovable losers, and who wants to stop rooting for somebody that's so lovable, right? And so they marketed themselves as being, this is a worthy product. Watch our terrible team because even though we're terrible, at least we're lovable while we do it. <laughs> People believe that, and they got ratings, and they got merchandise, and now they're getting all sorts of new Cubs fans. I don't know about here, but in Nashville, I see all sorts of Cub hats and, and jerseys with, with their tags still on them as if they've been rooting for the Cubs for 100 years. We got to pull the tag off 100 years when they bought the hat because they're the lovable losers, right? We message something and say it over and over again, and maybe someone will believe it. That's true with regards to religious things as well. You know, certain people use a phrase enough time and they confuse enough folks that, that they begin to, to believe that, that the phrase is actually true. And one of those is this phrase, and maybe you've heard it before, all religions lead to the same God. 
And by that, they mean that, that any sort of belief you have, any sort of faith you have, ultimately leads to the same destination. So why do we argue so much about which one is right? Now, that can be with regards to the, to, to the numerous different expressions of Christianity, but also to the, to the world religions. They say, why are we arguing? Religion all has the same basic teaching, and they all lead to the same God. Now, if you think through that statement, even for a brief minute, you see the issues with, with that sort of thinking. But I want you to see that it's said often enough that people begin to actually think it's true. In fact, I've talked to individuals who we've had discussions who, who didn't grow up in church and really hadn't had a background in any sort of religion thing. And we'll, we'll discuss what I do. You know, normally I, I get a haircut the same place with a different person and they'll cut my hair and they'll talk about their weekend sort of escapades. And sometimes it's not really Christian stuff they talk about. And eventually they ask me, so what do you do for a living? And you almost got to like, you almost feel bad. You're like, well, I preach. And they just kind of change their subject. And they say, well, I don't go to church very often, but, but you know, I really think all, all these stuff just we're all going to the same place, so we need just to stop arguing about this sort of stuff. Now, the barber shop, when the lady is cutting my hair, it's not the best time to argue with somebody about religion. I've had bad haircuts. I don't want to make them worse because I got an argument at the time of my haircut. But you, you do stop for a moment and you think that person has never thought that through for even a moment. Because if they had, they would understand the, the ludicrous nature of that particular claim. Think for a moment about the, the major world religions that we know of. Think about Hinduism for a second. You know, all religions lead to the same God. Most religions can't even agree on who or what God is. Hinduism says there are numerous gods and goddesses. A friend of ours is from India, and she is a practicing Hindu, and we've been studying the Bible with her, and so she, she believes she's both a Hindu and a Christian, which kind of fits her viewpoint, because in Hinduism, you just have lots of gods, so Jesus has just added to her stack. So I go to her house. She, she makes this Hindu meal for me, uh, Indian food, uh, you know, White guy, Indian food, did not turn out well the rest of the, the, rest of the next week. But I, we ate the food, hotter than I wanted it to be. But she takes me back and says, I want to show you this cool thing in my bedroom. And again, she's from the mindset that all of us are the same. And we go into a guest room, and for the first time in my life, I saw a real idol. Like one of the things where it's a statue, and you've got candles burning to it. It was her idol of Krishna. And she was telling me about the God that she worships, and she talks to him, and he protects their house. And I stopped for a moment and, and thought to myself, Myself, that's not the same God I serve. You know, every religion leads to the same God, but her religion doesn't. Think about Buddhism for just a moment. The, the, the big religion there, we've got a Burmese family uh, who's, who are actually a whole Burmese congregation within Woodson Chapel. They got rooted out of Myanmar, Burma, because of the Buddhist, the radicalism there. And they moved to the United States, ended up in Nashville. We've been able to take them in, converted a good portion, have a, have a little worship service that they're a part of. And they talk about Buddhism. Well, Buddhism's God is, is no God. Uh, there's really no God. It's just this higher sort of evolving of yourself until eventually you become a part of a greater consciousness. But yet we live in a world that says all religions lead to the same God. Well, you've got humanism that basically says you are God, just self-actualized to the point to where everything's what you want it to be, and you're a God yourself. Or you've got Islam, the, the other major religion of our world, that, that their God, Allah, and the God I serve aren't the same God. And you, again, you hear the ludicrous nature of such a statement. But if something is said often enough, and over and over again enough, eventually people start to believe it. And eventually these people start to believe it so much so that whenever someone says Jesus is the only way to salvation, that particular statement doesn't merely just become a statement someone makes, but an offense to the very thinking of the culture of the day. Let's think for a moment that Jesus has some sort of exclusive claim to salvation in a multicultural world it seems to be an outdated sort of mindset from a bygone era. A time in which we were simple-minded people with simple-minded ideas that we actually think that there's only one particular way to God. I don't know if you guys have this bumper sticker here, but we have a bumper sticker called Coexist. Have you guys seen those before? And you've got... Uh, 
you guys have a lot more Subarus here than we have in Nashville. So I don't want to, I don't want to disparage Subaru drivers in general, but the Subaru drivers in Nashville have a higher percentage of the coexist things on the back of their car. It, you know, I'm running, I see coexist, and I can almost guess it's a Subaru, and most of the time I'm right to have it there. Well, they've got coexist with all the different symbols of world religion all across the back of their car. And what they really mean is not coexist, but don't exist. Because the whole point of that is not so much that we all need to get along, because I agree with that. What their point is, you need to give up any truth claim that offends anyone else, and therefore we'll all get along, right? If you have a truth claim that in some way is exclusive, you are the problem. That's the world we live in. You know, we don't have to try very hard to be offensive in our culture. Now, some Christians are very good at being offensive, and they try a lot harder than I think they should, but we don't have to try very hard to be offensive in a pluralistic culture because our basic message is a message of hope, but a message that says the only way to salvation is Jesus, that there's no other way that anyone can find their way to God in relationship with God except following Jesus. Now, I'm not old enough to talk about the good old days. Ten years ago, I was playing football in South Dakota. That was the good old days for me. You know, nice, cool weather. I uh, felt like I could run forever. That was the good old days. But some of you remember, maybe in your mind, the, the good old days where certain truths were maybe more acceptable than they are today. You know, today, any sort of truth claim that says something is right and therefore other things are wrong is hammered against. If you today say there's one particular sexual ethic that God has determined it's man and woman in the, in the matrimony of marriage, you are a bigot. You don't have a different opinion, but you're a bigot now because how dare you be somebody who might imply that someone else's, and that's the key word, lifestyle, they say, uh, their choice or the way they're born might actually be wrong is the cultural background to it. Or if you say that God desires you to live holy, and maybe give some specific applications to holy living. You're judgmental in a world that says, well, holiness shouldn't be something that you worry about. Or if you claim that God regulates worship in some way, that, that we have a responsibility to give God what He desires, then you're being narrow-minded and unconcerned about the loss. You know, all sorts of, of buzzwords are used when you talk about, even for a moment in time, any exclusive claim. And if you say salvation is only through Jesus, then you are a hate-filled person. To think for a moment that those who don't know Jesus or those who've rejected Him aren't going to make their way to heaven. What sort of nasty person are you? And we live in a world that said every path eventually leads to God. But we serve a Jesus who says, I am the way the truth, and the life. And that has always been a friction. There's never been a point in the history of the church where that particular statement hasn't ruffled the feathers of the culture of the day. And there, there are reasons people reject Christianity that I think are our fault. You know, there are some things that, that Christians do that hurt the witness of the gospel. But there are some people who reject Christianity because they don't want to be a part of a group that they view as exclusive no matter what Jesus says. They reject the truth claims of Christianity because in their mind to even assume for even a moment that there's one way really doesn't work. No, we want our religion like we want Burger King. The have it your way religion. Uh, if you are a teenager, close your ears, but let me share a teenage story for a moment. 15-year-old uh, Wesley used to enjoy on Friday nights after football games to get in his car with his buddies and drive to fast food restaurants and order food of a different fast food menu's restaurant. So Burger King's slogan is, have it your way, but I know from experience that's not true. <laughs> If you pull up to Burger King and you'd say, I'd like a Big Mac, they will say, sir, we don't serve Big Macs. If you ask for a 12-count extra crispy, they will again say, sir, we don't serve extra crispy, we have chicken nuggets. If you ask for Taco Bell, they will politely ask you to leave the drive-thru because they're not going to give it to you. 
Now, their slogan is what? Have it your way. You should be able to go to Burger King, and I should have it my way any way I want it, right? I should get a taco or, or chicken or whatever it's supposed to be. I should have it my way. And if you go to Burger King and you say, you know what? I want a Whopper, and I want French fries and a drink, but I don't like your price. It's a little bit too exclusive, right? I want something a little cheaper. Uh, uh, I say I'm a very frugal and cost-conscious individual. Uh, if my wife was here, she would say I'm cheap. And so I'd say, you know what? That burger, I know it's a a $1.99 menu, but can we go cheaper? They're going to tell you, no, that's the price that we have. See, even the restaurant chain that says you can have it your way is exclusive, and when it actually comes time for you to have it your way. But where again, the exclusive claim that Jesus is the 100% only way to salvation has always called ruffles in our world. Acts chapter 4. You've got the story of Peter and John preaching the gospel. You know, Acts chapter 1, you have the sort of final time with the apostles and Jesus, and he heads up in the clouds and says, wait for the Spirit to come upon you. And Acts chapter 2, you've got the Spirit coming upon them and the preaching of the gospel, and you've got the laying out of the central message that drives the rest of the book of Acts, that Jesus of Nazareth is more than just a carpenter's son. He is Lord in Christ. And you've got the response of the people, what shall we do? And you've got a multitude of folks joining in to be disciples of Jesus. In chapter 3, you've got sort of a repeat of chapter 2. Once again, folks and individuals becoming children of God. And in chapter 4, you have a continuation of preaching. Here's Peter and John, two of the apostles. They're going into the different places and they're preaching the gospel of Jesus and they're upsetting people. In fact, they're upsetting some of the same people that Jesus upset with his exclusive claims, his radical teachings that he was the way to the Father. And so they they get caught into the the, the, the principal's office, so to speak. More of a jail. Uh, Your principal's office might be nicer than mine, but you got caught into jail, and there they are gathered in front of the religious caretakers of their day. And their caretakers are saying, guys, you need to stop preaching this message. What message? Well, verse 2, or that Jesus Christ is resurrected it from the dead. So there's this confrontation between the religious leaders of the day and Peter and John, and they say, look, you need to stop preaching this message. See, the message of exclusivity has always been what the world world hasn't liked. In the Romans' day, it might not have been the idea that all religions go to the same God, but in the Romans' day, you had issues such as there are numerous gods. Stop preaching there's only one. You're upsetting our local idol, right? Every time something bad happened in a Roman city, it was very easy to blame the Christians. Those atheists over there don't believe in our God, and that's why things are bad. You know, much of first century persecution, that's what happens. Something bad happens, we need something to blame. They blame this little crazy fringe group called Christians and they persecuted them because they stopped believing in the right gods. You had folks that said follow our gods. You had those who would say that you need to follow some sort of of law system or or, or get the traditions of the father right or make sure you, you withhold to our standard of righteousness. You'll earn your way to heaven by law keeping. But not just God's law, but our law. Not just our law, but even these crazy laws we've made up that are, that are so difficult, we won't require them upon ourselves. You've got to do that to get to heaven. That, that's what they wanted. Or, or your own goodness just gets you there. See, there's always been sort of this fight between an exclusive claim that Jesus is the only way and the world that says there are numerous ways. Pick the one that fits you best. And so Peter and John are told to stop rocking the boat. Why are you in this temple preaching about Jesus? You should be towing the party line as good Jewish men. You should be there making sure you're speaking against this blasphemer, Jesus, not speaking for him. The problem is people are believing. People are beginning to accept the message of the resurrected Christ. And they begin to inquire, why are you preaching about this man? And why are you healing these people? In his name. Later we're going to find out that again they'll be arrested. And they'll have those same questions asked of them. Why are you doing this? And he answers our text this afternoon. And they said. Rulers and elders of the people. This is verse 8. If we are on trial here today for a benefit done to a sick man. As to how this man was made well. Let it be known to all of you. And all the people of Israel, 
that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. For Jesus is the stone which the builder rejected, but today is the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven to men by which we must be saved. You ever stop for a moment and wonder why the apostles went through the abuse they did? The jailings, the beatings, the premature death, the exile. You ever wonder why the earliest disciples went through all the abuse that they did? Because they were convinced of one simple claim, that salvation is found in no other name. You know, we come here today and maybe we want to feel better in the world that we live in. That we want to fit in a little better in the world we live in. We want to be more accepted in the world that we live in. And so maybe today there, there's a temptation for us to, to, to walk back the exclusive claims of Jesus. There's always that temptation to shrink back whenever difficult times come along. But, but I want you to see that if the claim is true, that Jesus is truly the only way to heaven, then what can we do but preach that message? If it's true that He's the only way anyone will find salvation, then, then how can we help but speak that message and live by that message? In John chapter 14, it's Jesus Himself who makes the statement that I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, Jesus was the most exclusive of any man you'll see. Read the Gospel accounts and look at the types of people who come to Jesus. It's not always the religious people who had their life in order. It's not always the well-to-do that had their coming to Jesus. It's, it's those people who are rejected by society. It's tax collectors and that euphemism word sinner that are, that are coming to Jesus. It's, it's, it's the outcasts. It's, it's people that others have given up on. It's the sort of people that whenever they dine with Jesus, the Pharisees say, this guy can't be the Messiah. Does he even know the type of people he eats with? There's never been a person more inclusive than Jesus or a religion more inclusive than Christianity. Our mandate is go into all the world. The book of Acts that we're reading and, and studying this text section of Scripture from is a book about the expanding nature of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. That, that's our mandate. All nations and all people. When God describes the glory of heaven, it's the idea of, of tongue, every tongue and tribe and nation singing praises to God. But yet the most inclusive of all men has a very exclusive claim. That I'm the only way to the Father. And the drive that led the early church to grow by multitudes was an understanding that the world had no other hope unless they found hope in Jesus. You know, I've talked to individuals, and Nashville is a changing city. We're in the heart of the South, but we are a growing city from areas of the country where people don't really have the, what I call the default mode of going to church. You know, in Nashville, you go to church because everybody goes to church. And if you don't go to church, you're weird. We got people moving from out west and from the northeast and companies are growing and all of a sudden around us are places like I grew up, South Dakota or, or California, where you, you have folks who, who think going to church on Sunday is a waste of time. And you talk to them and they say, well, well are you saying I'm, I'm going to hell? Which is always sort of the default. Like, let's go from, you know, you may want to consider coming to church on Sunday and their default is to go as far off to the right as they can. You're saying I'm going to hell, right? That, that sort of conversation stopper. Or are you saying that, that a person, are you saying that you're right? Are you saying that Jesus is this? Are you, and, then their, and their point is, can you really believe that there's only one way? And they're shocked that anyone would have an exclusive claim that there's only one particular way to a particular path to finding God. You know, my son was diagnosed, and you guys have prayed for this, and about a month ago, maybe a little longer, the elders here wrote me a letter saying you pray for it. And it's been the neatest thing to get letters and cards from people I don't even know saying they're praying for Emmett. My son was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And we went into a cystic fibrosis clinic, and the doctor there said, here is his treatment plan. 
it's a pretty exclusive treatment plan. It wasn't pick your options or what do you want to do. It's when you get up in the morning, you've got a 20-minute albuterol treatment. It's a mask over his face where they put this stuff down into his lungs and hope to open him up. Then you've got a 20-minute tapping of his chest that's done all over his chest, all over his sides, over his back to help clear his lungs. That's every day, every morning and every night. When he gets about four years old, they'll add another hour worth of stuff. And every day for an hour and a half, he's set with these treatments. What he has to do twice a day for an hour and a half. Every day we have a schedule. My wife bought a whiteboard just to kind of keep track of his lifelong medications, liver medications and medications for, uh, for the, the different vitamins he's deficient in and stuff to help him dissolve his food and even a formula chart to know how to create his formula to be higher calories uh, than what other kids have. So there's this long sort of list that's very exclusive, right? It's like the doctor doesn't care about my schedule or how often we have to do this. They're saying this is the plan you have to use to give your son the very best chance of long-term survival. So guess what we do? We use that plan, right? The doctor's very rigid about it, but we use the plan. A couple of weeks ago, we met with a CF specialist, and we were just talking about long-term, what's out there? You know, is there any, there's no cure for CF right now, but there are some drugs that manage the underlying cause. Uh, None of them would work for my son at this point. So we asked him, is there something out there? And he named three or four companies and said, we're working on stuff. He's a part of the bigger foundation, and we're working on stuff to hopefully one day have a pill that my son can take that replaces these therapies and deals with the underlying issues that he has genetically. You know, the day that they announce that pill is available, and the FDA says he can use it, we're going to be at that clinic taking that pill. And I'm not going to care for a single moment in time that the exclusive nature of this pill hurt pharmaceutical company B whose pill didn't pass or the fact that I'm not going to buy other stuff. I'm going to take that pill and let my son have that pill because I know he needs this. Why is it that we're proclaiming an exclusive message and believe that message? Because it's something that we need. And the world needs. Peter and John will face all the persecution that life has to offer because they're convinced that individuals need Jesus for salvation. And that's maybe the key idea here for just a moment. That each person needs salvation. And we use that word often. And sometimes we use words so often they lose their meaning. But do you grasp for a moment what's being said in a text like Luke that talks about salvation is found in Jesus? Do you grasp for a moment exactly what's being across here, that God is, is saving us from our sin and ourself and our own destruction, that God is cleansing our conscience and making us new? Do you grasp the, the magnitude of what it means to be saved? That God has done something for you that you could not do for yourself. No matter how hard you tried, how hard you worked, how many good things you did, there was no way for you to save yourself, but yet God has stepped in and done something for you. God has allowed us to have a moment in time in which we can be saved. You know, there's a statement that's made, I'm not sure who to attribute it to, that talks about if, if our biggest need was some sort of curing of a medical disease, then maybe God would have sent a medical doctor to help us in some way. If our biggest disease was the fact that we are ignorant, maybe God would have sent a highly educated teacher to solve all of our problems. Or if our biggest disease was some issue with finances, maybe God would have sent a financial guru. But our biggest need was salvation. And so God sent a Savior. And so whenever Peter here makes it clear their only way to salvation, he he wants us to understand that salvation is so wonderful that facing any persecution you have to face to believe in Jesus is worth it ultimately. That that 100% salvation is so worth it that it doesn't matter what it costs you. That's the sort of life that we need to live. We sometimes worry about minor inconveniences. Christians can be whiny sometimes because people are whiny and, and most Christians I know are people so they're whiny as well. We can be whiny about every slight offense that we find in the world, right? Any time in life that we don't have a place of privilege at some place in the, in the national table, we, we begin to complain about the difficulties we're facing. And yes, there are difficulties and they're probably going to increase. But look for a moment at the difficulties they face in the book of Acts. Look at the men who are our heroes to some degree and the difficulties they faced in life. Look at Paul's statement that says, us apostles, we are paraded around as fools for what we're doing. 
Why would they do that? Because they knew the world needed a Savior. And they knew they needed to preach that 100% pure salvation. You know, if you understand you need something, you accept the help without conditions. If you truly understand you need something, you, you don't worry about what conditions are needed. You know, if the airplane is crashing, and they say grab your life vest and put it on, you're not going to worry about the color of the life vest, or whether or not it's, you like the, the, the particular place you're crashing. You know, is it a nice warm place or in a cold place? You're going to put the life vest on. If you're jumping out of an airplane, if you're one of the crazy people who jumps out of good airplanes and they're not pushing you out in the military, and you want to make sure that you use the parachute, you don't get halfway down and think, you know what? I didn't like this parachute. It's somewhat burdensome. Uh, it's too hard. It's too restrictive. Let me take this off. No, you open the parachute. Maybe you don't because you're crazy in the first place for jumping out of the airplane, so maybe you're so crazy you just don't open the parachute. But, but again, if you understand what you need, you're willing to accept help without conditions. We had a flood in Nashville, and our church responded by sending teams out to tear out drywall and help people out. And they had people there who, who, who were self-sufficient. They, they lived in their houses for years. They, but in that moment in time, they were willing to accept help because we need somebody to help us in this, this case. We went to New Orleans after Katrina. We were down there in the, in the midst of all the heat of that stuff. And, the, and again, you went from house to house, tearing out drywall, cleaning things up. And the people there just, just accepted random strangers in their house because we need help. We can't do this on our own. And if we understood that salvation was something so great we couldn't have on our own, we wouldn't quibble about what God requires. We wouldn't worry about the fact that it's done through Jesus when we wish it was done some other way. We wouldn't argue over whether or not we want to believe in exclusivity in an age of pluralism. We simply accept the gift that God has given us. But why Jesus? Verse 10, it says this, Let it be known to you that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead. Why is it that Jesus can make the exclusive claim to be the only way? Because He died for you. And God raised Him from the dead. If you survey any moment in time the major world religions and ask about salvation, you don't find a Savior. You don't find a God who dies for you. In fact, most of them spend all their time figuring out how to appease a particular temperamental God and trying to make their way to the next stage of personal development to they ultimately get to where they want to go. You don't read stories of a God who becomes flesh, who becomes like man and dwells amongst us and faces the abuse that Jesus faced. You don't read stories of a God willing to be crucified. In fact, it was foolishness and inoffensive to the heart of the first century reader to think that God would die on a cross. But since Jesus died, and more so, yes, He was raised, He can make the claim. If you want to make a counterclaim to the argument that Jesus is the only way to salvation, then make that claim after you've been raised, three days after you died. And I'll listen to it. Make your claim after you've been seen, after you've died by hundreds of other folks, and then I'll listen to your claim. But until your body is no longer in a tomb, and you are resurrected walking amongst us, then don't make a claim that there's any other way to salvation but to Jesus. Verse 12, as we conclude here. He finishes the words with this. Given among men, by which we must be saved. See, for Peter, salvation is something each person must do. Each individual needs to hear the message of Jesus. And each person who hears that message needs to accept the salvation that God offers. Yesterday morning, I preached on the simple gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul breaks down that gospel as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And we spend a lot of time discussing each aspect of that. 
But Paul says it's the gospel in which you are saved. Or in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Peter's saying something very similar. That all of us must be saved, and the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus. There's not a person in this world who's living who doesn't need a Savior. That a person in this world who's living who has not found the full effects of sin on their life, who hasn't been separated from God. And there's not a message in this world that can save man beside this one. The gospel of Jesus. There's no other name. Search all the birth certificates in the world over. Given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Chapter 4, verse 12, gives a negative and a positive. The negative is this, no one else brings salvation. And as hard as people try to argue differently, that truth still rings true. No one else can bring salvation. But also a positive, Jesus can. We live in a world that seems to dwell in the negative of that that seems to dwell on the first half, that no other name, and forgets the beauty of the second half, that God didn't leave us without a Savior, but rather sent Jesus. And because of Jesus, I can be saved. You know, a phrase said over and over and over again, eventually is taken as fact. And so many people believe as fact that all religions lead to the same God. But the truth is, there's one way. And what we should be saying is not all religions lead to the same God. But whether there is no other name under heaven given by men by which we must be saved. Let's pray. Father, as we conclude our time this afternoon, I pray, Lord, that you will help us fully appreciate the salvation in Jesus. Help us to face whatever persecution we're going to face and continue to believe and preach this message. Father, I want to thank you, not that there's no other name, but there is one name. I want to thank you that you did give us a path and that Jesus is our way. In His name we offer this prayer. Amen.